Darkness 
soul But I give you control Consume me from the inside out more Let justice and praise Become my embrace To love you from the much for the opportunity to sing out our praises from the inside out. God, the, the opening talks about the fact that we have failed you. And God, we recognize today that we fail you quite a bit. And that's our confession to you is that we fail, but we also are asking for your grace that will cover our failure. God, there are things that we might even have today that we're walking in and saying, God, here's what I need to confess to you as my Lord and Savior, that I need you to help me from the inside out to become the person that you're asking me to be. I need your grace to cover that which I'm struggling with. I need your grace to help me in the places of difficulty in my life. And so, God, we acknowledge and ask for your help to be the, the rock by which we can hold on to for you are our refuge and our strength. You are our ever-present help in time of trouble. But we must recognize that without you, we are nothing. Without you, we cannot do anything in this world. But we know and confess and proclaim that in you there is life. And when we embrace the life that you have for us, we experience life to the full. And we want to give you praise and thanks for all that you are and all that you are doing in our world, and on our lives. God, we come before you today and we, we think about people who are walking through some difficulties in life. God, we're glad that Andy's here with us today and we thank you so much that you are still working in his situation. We ask that you'll continue to touch him. God, we pray for Justin as we know he's been going through some difficulty th difficult uh, issues health-wise. We think about Marvin who is still struggling as he's at Seton Hospital. And we want to lift him up to you. We want you to, um, to lift up our, our, uh, our shut-ins today. God, we think about those at our Randolph Nursing Home. Uh, we think about uh, Gary and Kathleen and Alice. And we ask that you will be with them today as they're at the nursing facility. And we've not been able to make contact with them as well because of the... Uh, the COVID-19 precautions. God, we think about others who are um, still stuck at home because of um, their risk of contracting this deadly, somewhat deadly, possibly deadly virus. And, and so, God, we pray for those who are, are struggling. God, we pray for those who need a touch from you. Maybe they're coming in here and they're struggling with something in terms of something very um, minor in their life or maybe something very major but that they don't, haven't shared with anyone. So that secret issue that they're facing, we ask that you will help them. God, we just ask that you will continue to be with us as, as we walk through these difficult days with COVID. God, we pray for our country, our world, as we know that there is lots of chaos and things that need help from you. We know that you are the only one who can bring us peace. And we just ask that you'll continue to be in our world both today and tomorrow and the rest of the time that we're walking through this world. 
And we pray all these things be done in your name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. Well, in just a moment, we're going to have our kids go to Children's Church, and uh, they're going to go uh, with Miss Amber. And uh, because today, unfortunately, Miss Melissa is not here because Braylon, uh, her son, was uh, had an inconclusive test, so they're treating it as a positive. And so I ask that you'll pray for um, Melissa and her family as they are just uh, trying to stay away. Uh, doing doing the quarantine protocols. So uh, pray for her. Uh, this happened just in the last uh, 24 hours with getting that word. So uh, just pray for her. We appreciate uh, uh, our staff uh, trying to help out today uh, with Children's Church. I know this is short notice, but we're doing the best we can in these COVID days. Amen? All right. Well, we're so excited that you are here with us this morning. And uh, we're going to start a new series today uh, that's going to correlate with our children's uh, messages as well from the best sermon sets uh, of sorts that Jesus gives us a lot of teaching and tries to help us out with understanding what it means to live out as a Christ follower in our world. What does it mean to practice Christianity? Well, one of the ways in which he talks about it is that we must set ourselves apart from those who do not follow after Christ. Look, to be a Christ follower is countercultural and is different. We should look and act and sound different than the world. What comes out of our mouth should sound different. What comes into our mind should be different. And I know sometimes we struggle with with issues on our mind, and so we have to say, God, that's not of you. Would you get that out of my mind? Would you change my thinking? And so the way in which we operate in our world must be different. So the things that we say, the things that we do, the things that we think must become in line with what it means to be a Christ follower. Is that easy? Not always. But is it what God has called us to do? Absolutely. And he wants to give us some help and wants to remind us that the stakes are high, but when we follow after Christ, he blesses us with blessing upon blessing as a Christ follower. And so I want to encourage you today to, if you want to start reading the passage of Scripture, we'll be here for a while, chapters 5, 6, and 7 out of Matthew. And uh, so if you want to get in the head, you can do that. But to be a Christ follower is not simply to bear his name to say, well, I'm a Christian. There's lots of people who say that they're Christians, but they do it for the wrong reasons. Maybe it's because of political gain or societal gain or, or some other reason that they want to take on that label. But they may not be living it out like God intended. You see, to bear the name of Christ means that we are to be recreated in the image of our Creator. We are to be recreated in what it means to look and be like Jesus. We are called into this kingdom, this kingdom of God, a kingdom that transcends this world. The God who created the universe and all that is contained there within desires to have us enter into his kingdom. However, there are requirements for living out this faith. And again, this faith is, that we're being called to is countercultural. In other words, it's going to look different than the rest of the world. I think one of the things that we are faced with in these days is the fact that sometimes as Christians, we don't look and act like Jesus. We look and act too much like those in the world. And Jesus is encouraging us and strongly urging us to live out this countercultural life. But this countercultural life is lined with blessing upon blessing because he is there to build us up, encourage us, and bring us to the place that he wants to bring us, which is always in a place that it has life at its very core versus death. So this morning, we're going to look at the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, chapters, chapter 5, verses 3 through 12. So if you want to look in your Bible, it'll be on the screen if you want to follow along. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure at heart, for they will see God. Do you hear how this is very positive? Blessed, blessed, happy are those. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In other words, their reward or their, their stake is not in this world. It is out of this world. And that's where we place our real hope and trust in the one we cannot see, but in one we believe has died for us and has created a life for us that's going to be stellar with blessing upon blessing. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. In other words, there are going to be people say, oh, you're like that because. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad you noticed. But most of the time, we don't necessarily feel that, do we? We feel the, the weight of that heaviness. But he says, blessed are you. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. In other words, you're among great company. Prophets. These are the people that God said, I want you to proclaim judgment and the good news of what it means to be a follower after God. And they didn't always like the message. You may not like my message today, and that's okay. I'm not here to win any brownie points. I'm here to simply express the very core of the gospel, the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom of God and that Jesus is talking about today through the Beatitudes? Well, the Beatitudes are an expression of the connection between a person's deeds, what they do, and the outcomes of their actions. In other words, there is a correlation with what we do and what the outcome becomes. Jesus is strongly ur urging his audience to do and to be a virtuous people who desire to experience God and his kingdom. The kingdom is not simply something we experience in the future, but is found right now in the present. We can experience the kingdom of God right here today. <coughs> oh, excuse me. God is gracious to those who embrace this call to righteousness. You see, we're called to a righteous living. So Jesus gives us the conditions for entering the kingdom of God. If we look at the first part of that section, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek. In that section, we, we start to understand that there are three main tenets of for living. So we talk about the circumstance of being poor in spirit, mourning, and meekness. And, and those those concepts were called to transcend the reality of this world transcends the earthly ties in other words what we have to start seeing is there's something bigger than what's here in this world there is something greater at stake than what we can see in front of us jesus is offering to emancipate us to set us free from some kind of slavery i don't know about you but i don't like that idea of slavery uh, the more that I see it, the more I see it in our world, and it happens in lots of different ways. People are a slave to a system. So people are a slave to this or that. Sometimes it's not because of their own choices either. But none of us like that idea of slavery. And Jesus came to set us free from sin and from death. You need to understand, this, this issue of slavery was so big to him that he wanted to set us free from sin and from death. That's why he came, and that's why he died. So our understanding of the world is that, that, is that the worldly perspective is the one with the most toys wins, the one with the most power, the one who has the most influence, the one who has the best claim to fame. Those are the people who are really doing it. Now, we may not, maybe none of us will hit the, the time most uh, impressive people in our world list 
Jesus doesn't care about that list. He's more, important, more intent on seeing us come into a faith in him to be changed from the inside out, to be living toward him. See, the, the reality is that what truly binds us is, our, is that which is hard for us to surrender, our will. We want what we want, and we want it now. We struggle with being patient and kind and gentle. We struggle with, I'm going to put you before myself. We struggle with all those things. And that is what we're, Jesus is calling to us to do and to be is countercultural, to be different than the world. But when we chase after the wrong things, the wrong goals in life, it leads us to a life less than what Jesus desires for each one of us. We can chase the wind all day long, but you're never going to catch it. Maybe you, didn't, maybe you didn't know that, but you can never catch the wind. You can never catch it. But living in this world is rough for the poor in spirit, the beat down, the oppressed, the humble. But those who are, follow God's ways of choosing to chase after the things that matter to God. What are some of the things that matter to God? Well, he, he shares some of those things. Being merciful, being pure, being righteous. Those kind of things are the things that will allow us to receive God's reward. Our reward is not just in heaven one day. But our life reward is also in the present when we experience the blessings of God through the kingdom of God. So we we see these first three virtues in the Sermon on the Mount refer to our gracious need for a Savior. The poor in spirit. Those who cry out. And mourning, the meek and the humble. These three characteristics of the Christian faith are the foundations of experiencing God's gracious connection to us. You know, God wants us to experience His grace. For by grace you've been saved through faith, this not of yourselves, but as a gift of God. He wants us to experience this gift. It's something that He does for us that we cannot do for ourselves. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. As James 4, 6 tells us, God is not, in, is not about giving more credence to those who are haughty and egotistical and all about themselves. God gives grace to the humble, those who are willing to say, not my will, but yours be done. It's not about me. It's about you, Jesus, and putting others before ourselves. It's countercultural. And it's because we understand that Romans 3.23 is at play, which says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The kingdom is at stake. People are going to hell in a handbasket because they're choosing to live a life that is full of choices that are not Jesus' choices. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. And that in Christ Jesus is referring to the fact that there's a present experience as well. As disciples of Christ, we should have that kind of heart that Jesus has. So we're, when we are repenting of our own sin, we're also mourning for those who are not repenting of their sins either. We see people who need a Savior, and we're interceding for them. We're praying for them. We share in crying out to God over the multitude of people who are living apart from God. It calls us to plead with God for the salvation of others. i got to tell you, recently God has been putting some new people in my life that he is asking me to pray for intently so that they will experience the life-transforming, gracious work of salvation in their heart and in their life. And i got to tell you, I didn't know that these people were going to be on my, on my prayer list, but God has been calling me to pray for them daily because I know that their very existence hangs in the balance. Right now they're saying, I don't want anything to do with God. I don't need that Jesus stuff. That's crazy talk. But can I tell you that when I hear that, my heart breaks just like Jesus' heart breaks because he desires to have a relationship with each and every person. He wants them to experience life to the full. But it has to happen in a relationship with Jesus Christ. So as Christians, as Christians, if we're going to take on that name, we need to be interceding for those who need Jesus. And I know some people are hard for us to pray for. I get it. 
Uh, there are difficult people in our world. But the more that we do the work that God has called us to do, to intercede for one another, the more that we will experience the freeing work of Jesus Christ. So we get these Christian virtues, right? So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? But the next section of, of, of uh, blessed paradigms, are, it's going to beg this question. And you might want to write this question down that you want to ask yourself later, which is, does this describe me? Is this what I am doing? Because all of those sections, all of these next parts, really are about virtues that we are being called to be and to do. But sometimes we don't always live them out as well as we should. So the question that we have to ask ourselves and that God wants us to introspectively ask ourselves is, does this describe me? Is this who I am called to be? So we have these virtues, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Let me just tell you, it's more than just listening to Christian music. It's more than just reading your Bible. It's more than just bringing your request to God in prayer. I want you to understand it is, well, that's vehicles to help us there. It, it's more than that. God wants us to have this yearning, this desire to be in his presence, to know him, to, kn to know more about him, to experience him, to bring us closer to God. Philippians 2.5 tells us that we should have the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus. And if we look at the section before that, verses 1 through 4, and, and the following sections, 6 through 11, and, and Philippians chapter 2, we find the fact that Jesus is, or Paul here, is calling us to be like Jesus and that we are going to put others before ourselves, that we are going to think about others. We're going to empty ourselves out to be all that Jesus wants us to be. So there's nothing left except to say, here I am, empty and open for you. So there's this desire to be filled with the things of God. But sometimes our desire, our thirst, is not necessarily for the things of God. Sometimes it's for relationships, friendships with others, um, possessions, career advancement. It can even be the perversion. We can be... be uh, hungering after the per perversion of the holy or vices. We'll talk more about that in the next coming weeks. But we're going to look at what does it mean to, to hunger after the wrong things. We can all hunger after the wrong things. We can fill our lives with other pursuits that God does not have first priority in our life. You need to understand that God wants us to put him first in all that we do. And we'll see that. He continues to share this in this whole sermon. I don't want to get ahead. I'm so excited about this Sermon on the Mount because the teaching in here is paramount to what it means to be a Christian. And what does it mean to live this out and this countercultural thing. But I'm going to tell you right now that the more that we hunger and thirst for righteousness, the more that we have purity of heart, the more that we experience the goodness of the Lord, the more that we experience his blessings and goodness in us and around us. A hunger and thirsting for God should call us to want to know him more and spend more time in his presence and practicing the heart of God. Putting others before ourselves. When we desire the heart of God, he will fill us with what we need and what we desire. If you're not sure about that, I encourage you to, re I'm going to reference Psalm 37 here for you. Go and read that because it talks about the fact that God wants to give, give us the desires of our heart, but he's also going to help us understand his heart so that our heart becomes his heart or his heart becomes our heart. It's an equal. So we have the heart of God beating within us and we start to live that out. So he wants us to hunger and thirst for righteousness. He wants us to be merciful, merciful. To practice mercy in the daily life includes being patient with others. I'll tell you, that's hard because people drive me nuts. Don't worry, I know that I can drive you nuts. It's okay. By being kind. Look, smiles and kind words can go further than you think. Forgiving others when they have hurt you or hurt others. Guess what? Forgiveness is a hard thing to do sometimes. To forgive somebody who has hurt you deeply? Oh, man. We all know that words hurt. Words hurt. We can say that they don't, but they do. So practicing mercy is a way in which we love people who might not fit into the category, or excuse me, that might fit into the category of being unlovable or difficult. 
I know even this week, I, I, I saw somebody that immediately brought this feeling of, I can't stand that person. Going to be honest with you, came to my mind, they've been off my radar, haven't seen them for a long time, saw them, I'm, saw this person, and, and immediately my mind was, I can't stand that person. But you know what, there, because the, the Spirit of God, I, I believe, wants to live in me, and I want the Spirit of God to live in me, said to me, that's not the right response. And I hung my head pretty quickly and dealt with the fact that I had the wrong attitude. Look, it's not because we, we're going to all experience bad attitudes from time to time. It's how we address the bad attitude. It's how we address the bad attitude. Guess what? All of us are going to make mistakes like this. I'm just trying to be honest with you to say, look, I deal with it just like you do. But it's how we respond to it. And I said, you know what? I need to have the right attitude. Yeah, they're difficult. Yeah, they've done things that just drive me nuts. But you know what? They need Jesus and they need to experience the goodness. And maybe one day they'll experience what God has for them. But right now, I need to be, have the right attitude and practice mercy. Man, was that hard. But I knew it was what God called me to with it, that issue of righteousness. So praying for others is one of the things that we do. And, and guess what? Practicing mercy means that we're praying that they will receive not the punishment they deserve. Because if we're to be honest, the punishment we deserve is always worse than what we receive in God's economy. Because the graciousness of God does not give us what we deserve. But allows us to be forgiven in ways that we don't deserve. So God wants us to be the same kind of way, practicing mercy just like he gives us mercy. The pure in heart. James 4, 6, excuse me, 4, 10, talks about the fact that the, will, the purity of heart is to will one thing. And that one thing is to only want Jesus, to have him at the very forefront. You know, we, the reality is that without Jesus, we cannot do anything. And many times what is standing between us and God is there's some kind of sin that needs to be confessed. Psalm 51 addresses the sin of David. David had had a, an affair with Bathsheba. She was good looking, and he said, that's what I want. It's not mine. She's somebody else's wife. It doesn't matter to me. I'm going to have a relationship. Ends up wiping her husband out in order to have her to himself. Finally, he's confronted by Nathan the prophet, and David is confronted with a sin, and he must address it. And because there's a part, a part of him that still wants to have a desire for the heart of God, recognizes that he must respond in a way that's hard. And so we get verse, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. In other words, I've not been faithful, but I need to have a faithfulness that needs to be renewed and be made new. Look, all of us at moments might get past what we're supposed to be doing. We'll get off the path. The question is, when we're confronted with being pure, will we address it the right way and say, you know what, God? Create in me a clean heart. Make me new. Change me from the inside out. So being in tune with the Spirit of God is crucial to our response to God. <clears throat> Blessed are the peacemakers. The world needs more peacemakers. If you have not paid attention to our world lately, our world, even here, just if we just look at the, our little microcosm of the United States, needs places where peace is overcoming chaos. Peacemakers are people who bring peace in the midst of that. And it can happen in lots of different forms. Believe it or not, peacemakers can come in pretty small packages. I've seen children be great peacemakers. They'll say, let's stop that. That's not the right thing. And they start to recognize what God is calling them to be even as a little kid. So you need to understand that there is... Peacemakers can come in various forms. But peacemakers have the DNA of the Father because they're there to turn chaos into peace. Restoring peace. And what are those people called? They're called children of God. I don't know about you, but I want to be a child of God. 
But in order to do that, we've got to be people who are practicing the peace, trying to bring peace. And I know sometimes we can be passionate about this issue or that issue, but we're still called to be peacemakers in the midst of it. Blessed are those who are persecuted. Is the third section. It talks about this persecution. Look, you're going to be persecuted in this world. It's going to be hard living in this world. To live a countercultural thing, people aren't going to think that you're, you're, you're the best thing. They're going to push back on you. Why are you such a prude? Come on, get a life. Those are the kind of things they're going to give us. They're going to push back on us. But let me just tell you this. Do not be afraid to be different in the world. Do not be afraid to be different in the world as long as Christ is living within you. As long as that difference is Jesus. Jesus reminds us in John 16, 33, that in the face of persecution, we're called to stand firm, to take courage. Because Jesus says, don't worry, I've already conquered this world. They don't have anything on you. Quit letting them, quit being sucked into their lies. The only person that has power is me. The only one who has victory is me. And if you're living in me, you will experience victory. You guys are being way too quiet out there. Now listen, this is the stuff Jesus is talking about, and he's really serious about it. He's like, in this world, you're going to have trouble. It's going to be a hard world. If you're going to live the counterculture, if you're going to take my name, it's going to be tough. But great is your reward. Stand firm. One of the, my favorite passages is to read at a funeral. Can I just tell you one of my favorite passages? It comes from 1 Corinthians 15. The last verse, verse 58, where Paul says to the people, Stand firm, my brothers and sisters. Stand firm, my brothers and sisters, because your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You can people can tell you that you're wasting your time. That resurrection stuff is a bunch of hogwash. That's just made up stories and whatever. And, and Paul says, Look. I pity those who don't believe, but I'm going to tell you, for those who have stayed the course, blessed are those who've labored in the Lord because your labor for the Lord is not in vain. So what are we going to be asked to do? One of the things we're asked to do in this world is to compromise. Compromise our position. And too often we compromise. But we are asked to stand firm. So be Jesus in the world. It's going to be costly. And in reality, it may feel that way. But I'm just here to tell you that if you are willing to stand firm in the midst of the persecution, if you're willing to be Jesus in the world, your reward will be awesome. It will bring more blessings, bring more joy, and you will reap what you sow, believe it or not. You will reap what you sow. So if you're reaping the right, if you're sowing the right things, you will reap the right things. If you're sowing righteousness, you will reap righteousness. But if you're sowing unrighteousness, you're going to reap unrighteousness. Look, I am here to tell you that COVID-19 has caused people to quit being Christians. We st- we're like, well, I'm scared. I don't want to. Look, Jesus said, be bold. Stand firm. Do and be what it means to be Jesus in the world. We're going to look at that next week about being salt and light in a world that doesn't want that kind of stuff. But what's the big deal is this. It's when we, it's when we are a child of God, we experience the blessings of God. When we are a child of God, we experience the blessings of God. I don't know about you, but I want to experience the blessings of God. Yes, it's hard. Yes, it means being countercultural. It means doing things that people say, oh, you're wasting your time. That's, that's stupid. People are getting hung up on that. You know what? There are things that we need to be hung up on. Because we say, you know what? That is messing up my relationship with Jesus Christ. That I don't want to have anything to do with it. Don't buy into the, the lies of Satan. He's going to tell you, well, that's okay. He wants you to think it's okay. Because he doesn't want you to live close to the one that we're called to desire with hunger and thirsting for that righteousness. So if you're a child of God, you're called to experience the blessings of God. 
Why is this a big deal? Because Satan does not want you to hear this message. Satan does not want you to understand that there is something greater at stake. Jesus wants you to know that you are blessed if you follow after me. If you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, Jeremiah 29, 13. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will add to you as well. I know I'm getting ahead of myself because that's Matthew 6, 33. It's one of the passages in here. I'm just telling you, the more that you put Jesus first, the more you will experience his blessings. Is it hard? Absolutely. Are you going to get pushed back? Yes, you will. But Jesus says, stand for him. Take heart, because I've already overcome the world. Would you stand with me this morning? God, we thank you so much for your power in the message, urging us to be a virtuous people who are experiencing the goodness of the Lord. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, man, I hear you, and I'm, I'm struggling because I'm, I'm thinking about that question, does this describe me? And there's places that maybe I'm not... Li- just not lining up as well as I should, would you pray for me? Would you intercede for me? Would you put me on your list of intercession? And and by raising your hand, I'm also imploring and asking the Spirit of God to also be interceding for you. And So I'm asking you to do it for myself to pray for you, but also the Spirit of God. So if that describes you, would you just raise your hand and say, I am desiring something bigger than what God, that I'm experiencing right now. I want to experience something more. Yeah. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I know that the first step I've got to take on this journey is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And and I I know that that's my first step, but I'm not sure how to get there. Would you just raise your hand? I'd love to maybe help pray with you this morning. Yeah. If you're joining us, maybe online, I just, this is how you pray. Dear God, I recognize that without you, I'm nothing. I need a Savior to... Take me from this place of where I just feel bound and screwed up. I'm tired of living in a place of chaos and I need peace. Would you come into my life and and start to turn my chaos into peace? Would you start to change the way I think so that it has I start having the, the right thinking, the mind of Christ? Help me to become set free from the stuff that binds me. If you prayed that prayer, I encourage you to maybe send us a note or just let somebody know that you decided today to choose Jesus over yourself. So we go from this place. God made the, the message and the words that we find in Matthew's Beatitudes. Shape our attitudes today. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus, the Son of God. In his name we pray, amen. Thank you so much for being here today. We look forward to seeing you soon. Look forward to being with you. So thanks for being here.